Hello, my name is Stephen Cohen. I am a business turnaround consultant, author, and founder of the Have Investment Fund. Welcome to the Inspiring Leadership Show. Now over to our fantastic host, Jonathan Bowman Perks. Thank you, Stephen. You're very kind. Now, Stephen and I met on Clubhouse. Indeed. And um, I just, I hear so many people on Clubhouse and there's far too much humble bragging. And in fact, actually, I've come off Clubhouse completely with all my CEOs uh, because it's just, it's the wrong forum. Yeah. And for the kind of leaders that, that you and I work with, Stephen, um, Zoom is a much better one where you can then send it out to like this podcast to 200,000 people in 55 countries rather than having a whole load of nut jobs listening into your thing and, and making some bizarre comments. It just, it just doesn't work. It works for some people, but it doesn't work for me. Uh, Stephen, I, I, I really connected with you then. I just heard you speaking to a large audience. I was just one of a large audience, but you were warm enough and kind enough to connect with me on Instagram. And, and, and then I read your book. Uh, I read your book, I found it profound. And I hope if I can find the right conditions and save up for it and all the kind of things, next March to go with you and your colleague, Lane Ballone, to um, Machu Picchu, to have a, a, almost like quite a, a purposeful spiritual journey as part of the humble alpha journey. So you've already made a massive impact to me, as well as I know you have done so many others. So I just want to say thank you uh, for thank the you. Difference, difference you've made. We're going to talk in a minute about your life, but even from what I've picked up, um, I mean, amazing time in the 4th, 8th Cavalry in the first Iraq war with many of my other colleagues who are in the armed forces. You've been very supportive of veterans, incredibly so. And you can talk about that later on. I'd love to hear you talk about that. Sure. But just the, the people that you've met, the lifestyle you have. And I related to it because I, I once in my early days went out with a, a multi-billionaire's daughter and found myself in this whole new world, which was quite bizarre. And, right. and, and then I was working for the head of the army. So meeting the royal family and also, and you sort of, it's this other world, but yet you still got to be yourself. And that came across so very strongly. The business people you met, the royal families you've met, the advice that you've given, but you still have the confidence, but you keep humble to who you are. So congratulations on that. Let's go into currently what you're doing. Say a bit more about what you're currently doing now. There's a whole variety of different things you're doing. Yeah, you know, it's it's all it's when when people look from the outside, they say, wow, you're doing so many things, so many irons in the fire, but it's not really. So in, in our book, we talk about your two word moniker as your your identity. And once you realize what your two word moniker is or what your identity is, that's where you go full in. Right. That's where your purpose comes from. And my two word moniker is powerful connector. So I'm into M&A. So I do M&A coaching and I'm, of course, in the M&A business. I have about 50 M&A people from around the world that I coach and I coach them for free. Because when I coach them, I help them structure the deals and, and close the deals. And therefore, I get equity. So I'd rather take equity later down the road than, you know, a small payment up front. And through that, I got into wanting to raise more money to do more deals. And we ended up founding the HAVE Investment Fund. HAVE stands for Humble Alpha Veteran Empowerment. And this is a, a diversified, open and diversified private equity fund. It'll be a Regulation A um, listed on the Americas. Um, and that should be coming out, should be ready to launch here in a couple of weeks. Um, we, have, uh, we have a few more uh, things to do on the PPM. Other than that, I'm a business turnaround consultant for the last 20 years and in, in, in over 10 countries. Um, you know, I, I led corporations. Uh, we had uh, nine countries, um, 87 locations. I've worked, well, yeah, just about everything. But for now, <laughs> along with being an author, the Humble Alpha Movement, we're building the training and, and uh, um, training and coaching infrastructure so that we can have certified Humble Alpha coaches. The book has been turned into a college course. It's now a college certificate program for anyone who wants to take it online. And Forbes Business School MBA program picked it up for their MBA uh, um, courses and uh, University of Colorado and a few more universities are following suit as we speak. Wow, that's a, a huge achievement. Well done on that. And, Thank you. and let's, go, let's go back from all that you've achieved and are achieving, because even though you're just 54, there's so much more that you can do, however long that uh, uh, fate has that you're going to be on, on the planet. Uh, but even when you're gone, I think it'll, it'll still be leaving a legacy. That's the plan. Take, take me right back. Take me right back to the young Stephen. You know, where did you grow up? Yeah, Who right. influenced you? What kind of values did you learn from the people around you at that time? 
Well, I was, I was raised very Christian. Um, so we had, uh, my, my mother was married quite a few times. First, I think we were Catholic, then Presbyterian, then Baptist. And, you know, so I learned a lot of the different types of Christianity. Uh, but what it did is it gave, gave me a moral basis of how to be a good person. Regardless if, you, if I believed in it or didn't believe in it or whatever, when you're around people like that, it's like frequency. When you're around high frequency, you tend to be a high, higher frequency yourself. So uh, that for me, that's, that's what the surroundings were all about. But I had no self, you know, self-belief, no self-worth. I tried sports. Every sport I tried, I, I was the worst at it in the entire school. Uh, I lost every game for the team, just not that I ever played in, which were very few games I played in. Um, you know, at the same time, I had a question the other day. Um, you know, I played, I, I tried basketball, I tried wrestling, I tried uh, ba- a foot, football, baseball, softball, uh, and I just was horrible at all of them. But then I realized that from all those years that I played, probably seven years in total, um, my, my mother came to one game, right? And so I, I feel like maybe that had something to do with, uh, you know, the, the, the no self-worth and self-belief because no one seemed to care. Well, that led me down a path of um, stupidity and self, you know, sort of self-pity. And I knew at that age of 17, 18 years old, that I would never get out of there, out of that, out of my head, unless I completely cut myself off from where I was. And that's why I decided to join the military. And when I went into the military, I got to Fort Knox, Kentucky, and I had, it was the 1980s. So I had the mullet, you know, the disco mullet going back around. And uh, when they took that razor and started shaving my head, um, I, I made a decision and looking in the mirror and I looked past my pupils into my soul and said, this is the new you. Everything that you knew that you could do, anything that you ever wanted to do, it starts right here, right now. And that's what I did. I became a stellar soldier. Um, I became um, a winner in just about everything I did. I was one of the highest decorated um, privates in, in the entire division. Um, you know, I got to take part in the coveted Canadian Army Trophy. I was one of 16 people ever to win that trophy to this day. Um, and it was, it was quite, quite a career. Uh, then, then I went to, and then I was sent to Iraq at Christmas of 1990, and uh, that changed everything. Um, you know, we were the very front. I mean, if we were any further front, we'd be Iraqi. Um, and we were, you know, the funny thing is they said, okay, you're leaving, pack your boxes, put different boxes for different people and put a letter in there and write your will. So, you know, we packed our boxes and I put letters in each box, one for my brother, my sister, my mother, and my father, my, my real father, my eternal father and wrote to them what I would write to them if I wouldn't come back. And a funny thing happened then is that I said, okay, I'm going to come back. I accept it. And I saw myself in the desert, you know, covered with a flag and a a casket or whatever. You know, I just think I was ready. I was like, okay, this is it. It didn't mean I didn't, I wasn't scared. It didn't mean I didn't have fear, but I was like, okay, I'm not coming back. So you leave everything behind and then you go to war and you almost die. Your buddy dies in your arms or my buddy died in my arms. I saw children, I saw women, I saw just horrible, horrible, horrible things. And, and then suddenly I was like, wait a second, (laughs) I don't want to die. The world can't be like this. And so I fought to come back and, uh, um, you know, I feel like I did my duty over there. I probably could have done more. Uh, but at a certain point I was like, I'm done, you know, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm just going to do the minimum. I'm not going to lie. I wasn't a freaking hero. Um, so, I mean, I got a bronze star if that means anything, but you know, um, it, it's, it was, it was a, it was a situation where to this day, I still have, you know, guilt about losing my buddy and why, why him and not me. And, you know, this kind of thing. I mean, I had, you have thoughts in your head in moments like that, you know, and I'm going to be honest right here. I don't, I don't know if I've ever said this, but when I saw my buddy laying there, you know, dying, my first thought was, Thank God that's not me, mm, yeah. you know, and that, that I carry that with me to this day. Like, how could I do that to him kind of thing? You know what I mean? Mm. So it's, uh, that, that, that really hit me. And that's part of the PTSD that we, that, that a lot of combat veterans have. It comes from that. It comes from survival guilt. It comes from the things you, you thought you had to do or did. Right. Mm. So, yeah. And I, I basically decided to get out of the military after that. And it took about a year and a half and I got out and I got a European out. Can I just step yes. back over sure. to that really tough time? What, if, if you can talk about it, what actually happened that led to your friend being killed? What, um, was, the, what was the incident? Well, we were in the, the Battle of 73 Easing, which is the largest tank battle since the Second World War. There's a video game made, made after it. It's the most famous tank battle in the last 50, 60 years. 
and uh, he was calling for fire. He was an FO, a forward observer. And he called for fire and they triangulated and dropped our own artillery right on top of him. Oh, so it was friendly, it was friendly fire. We didn't know it at the time. Yeah. But we found out later it was friendly fire. Yeah. And you know, that makes it even worse. You know, it's like, could, are you, you know, I mean, how, how do you, you know, part of the team that killed your buddy and then you're with them with them as well. So yeah, it was, it was difficult. I think what, where humanity really hit me wasn't then because what you do in that moment is you push it away you can't go into sorrow and fear and you have to push it away because you're in the middle of a battle. What happened after that is when we had the ceasefire, um, we were standing on Highway 8 outside of Basra. And if, if a lot of people don't remember, but President Bush Sr. said to the Shiites, form an uprising against Saddam in Basra and we will support you. So they did. And we were told to stand down. We were right outside of Basra. And we watched as the city burned and people fled and pe people were murdered and, and slaughtered. And we couldn't do anything because we had that demarcation line. And the Republican Guard was, was an eye shot with us, pointing weapons at us and playing with us because they knew we, we, couldn't, we couldn't cross over or, or take anything for you, shoot them or whatever. So I'm standing there one day on one of the checkpoints and this little girl comes up and she's got her hands out like, you know, like this. And she's far away where I couldn't tell what was going on. And she had this pink like summer dress. And I was thinking like, when well, she's walking with this woman and as she gets closer, I see that she's burnt from her neck down and her clothes are burnt into her skin and this dress was on top of her, right, to, to cover that. And she came up with her arms out because they were hurting, I guess, because of the burns. <sighs> you know, she was like eight years old, maybe, maybe seven. Beautiful little girl. And I sent her to the medics, which we had a track, you know, a, a 113, they call it, a, a personnel carrier. It was built out to be a, a medical track. And uh, when she came out, she was bandaged up and they had to dress back on her and stuff. And uh, she came over to me. And I wanted to do something, you know, I, here I am this big six foot four helmet, flak jacket, M16, 45 caliber, you know, gas mask hanging on my hip. Looks like, you know, who knows what I'm wearing, right? The grenade pockets and everything. And I, I get down on my one knee and I wanted to show her something, right? I wanted to, I wanted to hug her. I wanted to take her home. I want I, you know what I mean? I wanted to help her. And all, all I could do was give her a piece of candy that I had in my pocket, my grenade pocket. So I gave her this little piece of candy and, and, and Jonathan, she smiled and I thought, oh, here I am complaining because it's too hot because I have to wear all this gear because the food's horrible. I have food, I have gear, I have, you know what I mean? I have everything that I need and she has nothing and she smiles and I'm complaining. Yeah. And I said, from that point on, I'm never going to complain again. And I've been looking for that girl since then. I got to tell you, like, you know, always I'm talking to people like, where are you from? And, you know, how old are you? <laughs> yeah. every, every time I meet an Iraqi, I'm, I'm an Iraqi woman. I'm asking, you know, because they're like, I want to meet her again one day. You know, I really do. Well, I, I, I really hope you do, because that was a profound story. And um, I remember reading that in your book and it's it stayed with me. It, it has stayed with me to this day. And uh, when you were... Uh, in the army before before you left uh, what, what what was your rank when you left just to give me an idea of kind of what you were doing i was a, I was a sergeant so yeah. i was you know so you're the, the guy, you're the guys who run things okay yeah. all, the, all, the, all the young rodneys like me we were just there going sergeant what should we do i remember i remember i i, I served with the scots guards just after they come back from the falcons oh, wow. war yeah and my platoon had been to war in 1982 and and i um in, in the Falklands, it was 82, I'm sure. Anyway, memory's gone. But um, mm. but I hadn't been to war. They had, my platoon had. And of course, it had scarred them all. Yeah. And and the sergeant was killed as they crossed the line of departure to go and attack Mount Tumbledown, left flank of the 2nd Battalion of the Scots Guards. And uh, the platoon commander uh, cried. He was a young lad, he was 19, and he cried because he just didn't know what to do. He tried not to show it. But he was he relied on the lance sergeants who were really the corporals yeah. to take them up the hill. And, and afterwards, he's told a good story. But but actually speaking to the soldiers, they said it was the sergeant who would have led us. And it was the lance sergeants who were firing the rocket launches and the GPMGs. Uh, but occasionally you get exceptional people like John Kisley, who was the, the company commander and got the military cross on the top of Mount Tumbledown because he shouted to guards from Galloway. Are you with me, left flank? The whole of his company. And the, this voice said, I am with you, sir. So no, left flank, are you with me? I said, I'm fucking with you, sir, let's go. <laughs> and the two of them took on this, this position. And he said, you lay down fire, but then you ran out of bullets. And there was still this machine gun nest on the top. 
So he took some socks and he shoved a rock in it and he threw it and said, grenade. And they thought it was grenade and they ducked and they went in and it was, he said it was grim. It was wow. absolutely grim because it was just bayonets. Yeah. They were just struggling and stabbing each other. And they, and they, and they took it and Galloway, humble guy, never got more than private soldier. Uh, but he was part of my Cyprus walkabout team. And I, yeah. I always, always remember him, but it's, it, it, it's, it, the lesson is that you need both. You need the officers and the sergeants, yeah. but the sergeants yeah. are often the ones who are the unsung heroes who make things happen and, and do the dirty work. Yeah. And we do it. You know, we, I, I remember being a sergeant. It was probably the, you know, like one of the proudest moments of my career to get that, get those stripes, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and because you just, you just know you're, you got to run it now. You, you got to make it happen now. And you also know you're setting the example. Yeah. You know, and, and just that setting example, I always compare that to, you know, if you get promoted to sergeant in the same, you know, so I was a, what they call a specialist. So you're private, private first class specialist and sergeant, right? And I was a specialist. And in the same company, I got promoted to sergeant. So one day I'm specialist, next day I'm sergeant. Well, I wasn't a sergeant to them, right? Because I was a specialist that they knew. But when I changed and I got stationed at another uh, duty station, I was always a sergeant. Like I was never anything else. And so that whole difference of attitude and um, I want to almost call it aroma <laughs> that's around you because mm -hmm. you are now fully a sergeant. You never are until you leave where you were, you know, yeah. a, a lower rank. It's and it's the same thing in corporate in the corporate world, it's, right? Exactly, exactly. exactly. I, see, I see this. There was a guy I knew in HSBC, and I said, "You're going to have to leave the organization, get promoted elsewhere, do some jobs there, and come back in because yeah. they're stuck with thinking yep. you're in this little box." Yep, yep. Yeah. That's exactly what way I've always talked about, you know. And it's it's um, something that we I think we use it in the book, even if I'm not mistaken. We 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 we, we talk about that example. Mm. of how it's really difficult to get over other people's, you know, hangups about who you are. Yeah. 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 And the, and the labels. Um, yeah. I, I do love your, your two word moniker idea. Inspiring and leadership are my two, but that might not, that right. might be a cheat. You're going to tell me when we're in, in okay. uh, when we're okay. out in uh, Machu Picchu. Yes. Um, incredible story. So, so left the military uh, having had some pretty harrowing experiences and that, that PTSD has stayed with you ever since. How do you manage it when it, it swamps you again and it comes over you? Because it happens to uh, my other friends. Well, you know, in the beginning, I, I didn't deal with it. I just, I didn't know what it was, you know, because back when I got out, no one knew what PTSD, no one even mentioned PTSD. There was no such thing as in the, in the civilian world. Apparently in the medical files that I looked at like two years ago, they, they already had diagnosed me with PTSD, but no, no one ever told me. And I didn't, since I didn't know what PTSD was when I looked at it, I just thought it was some medical acronym. So only in 2012 did I get, did I finally get diagnosed and compensated um, with a pension, um, but without even asking, they basically told me you're you know you're you have a presumptive um, rating because you were in Iraq at this time with this unit and this day and this is what happened and so you're pretty much screwed. So, <laughs> so they said. So, um, well, you know, I, um, I and when I first got out, I I was I mean I was an animal, just aggressive. And I got out, I got a European out. So I, I was stationed in Germany the whole time. And I got a European out and stayed. And I got into the nightclub scene. What else do you do, you know, when you're a tanker, right? So I was a doorman, got into fights every night, got into fights every day. Um, and I ended up, you know, going to court a couple of times and being in, in jail overnight a couple of times mm. for fighting and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, I got sort of a reputation of someone to be scared of. I ballooned up, you know, to, I don't know, I was probably... 100, I think I think my highest was 136 kilos, 135 kilos, just muscle, just muscle head all day long in the gym and then at night on the door, you know, one of those guys. Mm -hmm. And um, it got to the point where I was in a rage constantly, like I had no, no control. And one time I was, I, you know, the, the owner called me and said, look, man, you need to chill out, do something. You're, you're, something's not right with you. And he said, look at this. And then he showed me the security camera where I was fighting five guys. And two of them were like, in front of me and three were on my back and I didn't even know it. I was just like moving as if they weren't even on my back. And I was like, wow, like, I don't remember that at all, you know? And that's when I said, okay, I need to do something. And so I left that job and then, um, you know, got like a, a job at the airport and thought it'd be a normal job and stuff. But then I really lost it. And I had, I woke up in the park one day naked in Berlin. And I was like, what the, where, how did I get here? Like I was literally naked in the park in Berlin, in the center of Berlin. I'm like, what the hell happened here? It's, it isn't a big deal in Germany because everybody's naked. <laughs> <laughs> they, they love being naked. It's so weird. They do. They do. Yeah. So anyway, so I, after all that, you know, I, 
I learned to deal with it, um, first of all, through ignoring it, which didn't work. And then I, now I deal with it. And, and, and honest, I tell you, Jonathan, it's every day. It's, it's every single day, whether it's when I get up or when I go to sleep, it comes back every single day. But now I deal with it as a part of my life. And it's a part of something that I have to deal with every single day. So when I accept that, I work with it and I see it as a thing, right? So when it comes, I'm like, all right, what do you want? Where are you right. taking me today? What's the issue? You know, and I'll like, okay, do you, whatever you want, whatever you want to do, just do it. And then I'll just let go and I'll follow my thoughts. And okay, I get it. I see, yes, it's messed up. And then I let it go out of me and I literally watch it go out of me as a thing. And I see it usually on the floor and I'm like, okay, you're done. Now go. And it just goes. Yeah. Like, a bit like, I, I, a bit I, like I, Chill's black dog. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 I literally see it as a thing. Otherwise, how, how do you grasp it? You know, how do you, you know, but I swear to you, sometimes I wake up and I, I open my eyes and I'm like, I want to stick a knife in my throat. You know, it's like, I just, you know, I'm just, it, that's just how you feel. It's you just for no reason, you know? And then you're sitting in the middle of the day, having a great time. And all of a sudden you get, uh, there's like a truck drives by and you smell the diesel and the sun's going down and you're just like instantly set back. And you're just like, Oh man, we're, we're, Oh my God. You know, or you smell trash. Uh, mm -hmm. in a dump or something and it's just, it just reminds you of that time it's it's crazy it's crazy but i've learned to deal with it well it still affects me every single day it's still taxing it has some it, it you know it creates some issues when i can't resolve it right away when i can't where i'm like for instance when i'm in peru and i'm dealing with my own things and then my wife calls or the kids and it's sort of like uh, you know you don't have that contact with them and it sort of festers in your head and then you know it's just oh my god it's crazy it's crazy it, mm -hmm. it's really destructive yeah yeah can be I, can be really destructive yeah. can't, i can't imagine what it's like and so just good luck with it really because well thanks i mean you know i have a, I have a great wife who understands me most of the time and sometimes she's like you're you're i think maybe you're just crazy <laughs> <laughs> aside from the ptsd you just yeah you're just, exactly you're just crazy, yeah. <laughs> okay so so let's go back um with this crazy man to yeah. this young 16 18 year old Stephen. um tough tough upbringing no doubt about it and and all that uncertainty with different people and who's mum now with and what religion are we now believing in what advice knowing all that you know now and you do give such great advice to so many people what advice would you give the young Stephen then if you went back and met yourself I think it would be only take advice from people who are certified to give that advice you know, everyone has an, has an opinion, everybody has advice, but very few people have actually done, been there and done that to be able to give that advice. And I've been led astray so many times for people who wanted something or wanted me to do something or wanted me on their team or wanted me on their, you know, company and this kind of stuff. So I think it would be like, you know, make your own decisions, create your own visions and follow your own advice until you find somebody who's been there and done that and follow their advice. Yeah. Oh God, that's so true. Um, even in my own uh, time, I uh, decided to invest in something. It was a complete scam. I, I lost 300 and fifty thousand uh, dollars, which is everything I everything I owned and uh, and more, um, and and it was because I hadn't done the due diligence. I I'd been given a bit of feedback. I'd asked for due diligence, been given given a bit of it, but I believed so much. I so wanted it to work, and it was a money making scheme that I I just got sucked in for ten years into something that I could hardly ever get out of, and it almost completely broke me emotionally and financially yeah. so so I, I do take that get the advice and and we also were talking about uh, good times proudest moments and also darkest moments um you've already talked about one dark moment but in your life or your work what would have been your proudest moment and what's been your darkest moment and what did you learn from both well i think starting from the darkest moment my darkest moment was when my when i left my body for like two weeks I had like a breakdown in Berlin and I couldn't get back to me. I was always up above watching below, watching myself and everything was echoing. And I thought I was literally losing my mind and I, I didn't know what was going on. And then I, you know, I, it just got to the point where I didn't, I just gave up and then I snapped back into my body again. That was scary. And what I think I learned from that was, is you can't force things that aren't supposed to happen. You know, you can't, you can try all you want. You're just going to waste your energy and hurt yourself. That's what I was trying to do. I was trying to force myself into something. Yeah. I think, you know, proudest moments, you know, I'm proud every day. I really am. You know, there's things that, you know, I'm proud of the accomplishments of all of my clients. I'm proud of the accomplishments of all the people that go through Humble Alpha. I'm proud of, of Lane being my partner, my wife. I'm proud of my kids. You know, I, I, I don't, I can't say there was one thing because it's all like a cascade for me. 
everything builds upon the other one and it just keeps getting better. <laughs> you know, um, you know, if you want to go through things like, okay, winning the Canadian army trophy, one of 16 guys ever to this mm -hmm. day, that's, that's pretty proud, but that's a thing. You know what I mean? Like that's a, that's a thing. It's nice, but I don't, I'm not a thing guy. I don't collect things. I don't buy things. I don't know. You know, I, I, I like emotions. I like depth. I like feelings. Right. So the feelings that I have with my family, with my kids, looking at my kids every single day in their eyes and going, man, they're amazing. Like amazing. Five and six years old. And my wife going, man, she's beautiful. 12 years. And I'm like every single day, I'm like, dang, she's hot. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know I, that's I, what I'm I, proud I, of. I'm proud I of being able the to, same. You know, I I'm, the same. I'm proud of fostering that relationship with my own mind to get out of the negative and to, to stay only positive and to be optimistic. And every single day, get up and say, today's the first day. Today's the first day. Well, uh, and you shared with me about the news about your brother, and I'm really sorry about that because it's when things like this happen that you realize how lucky you are with the loved ones you have around you and the children you have, uh, like you. I've got children. My, my four are uh, aged 25 to 29, and um, we've got little baby Grace. So I'm a grandfather, grandfather. Who, who's, who's just four months old. And... Um, you know, these, these things happen. On the one hand, you get some good news. On the other hand, you get some bad news, you know. On the one hand, on the 13th of January, baby Grace was born. Uh, on the, the next morning at 4 a.m., my brother was attacked uh, and someone tried to murder him and burn his house down. And, and you just go, how can, how can these things happen in your life? And they all are sent to test us. But you do seem to have found, not the solution, but you found a way to manage with a whole variety of things going on, but also the hard experiences you've had, I think has taught you to be able to, in a humble way, the humble alpha way, get others to, to, to take ownership of their life and, and what life is treating them. Is that fair? That's pretty much it. You know, when we wrote the book, Un Unleash Your Humble Alpha, and hold it up here for your, for your viewers, Un yeah. Unleash Your Humble Alpha, my co-author, Lane Ballone, and I, we, we looked at our lives and said, how did we get to have such amazing lives? And it's, it's all relative, you know, but to us, if they're amazing, to other people, they're not. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me because it's my life. And, and we said, well, what were the things that we did that always led to the good? And what are the things that we did that always led to the bad? Right? So where is the trend in our life? It took us a year to write that book, dissected every single moment of my life when I was like 12 years old onward. And what were the things that made a difference? And then we found these and saw if they repeated themselves and how they developed over the years. And we wrote a book about it. So every, every section, there's five sections. Every section has a story, a lesson from that story. And then the exact action steps you take on what to do, not how to do it, what to do. It's, it's not a how-to book in order to unleash your true identity, purpose, and certainty. Yeah. And just by writing that book, it made us even more certain. You know, yes. I mean, it made us, it, it, the articulation of your life in a book is a must for anyone. Yeah. Uh, it's and, a must this, for anyone. And this is why I so liked Unleash Your Humble Alpha, because having written my own story in inspiring leadership leadership lessons from my life right um i'd gone through that journey but it was in 2010 so that was some time ago now and and i am going to write the next one which is inspiring ceos and their executive teams which I, i've now got the material for i just need to sit right. down and write it uh, and i keep procrastinating and avoiding it but i will do it um and um the reason i say that is in reading yours and i've, I've spent you know some I suppose quickly, I'm approaching 60 now, a lot of my life thinking about the things that you wrote about, but I still really enjoyed it and saw it afresh. And also being someone who's dyslexic, so I listened to it, I downloaded the PDF and I went through the various stages of the PDF. In my way, I listened to it and then I went back and I listened to it again. And at each chapter, I then started to make some notes. And I found it was very congruent with the, the inspiring leadership work and research that I've done and Lee's done, my wife, I just really like uh, what, what you and Lane have written about. And I'm gonna be interviewing Lane in October, which gives us a nice, a nice gap between you both uh, and what goes on. So thank you for that. So let's, let's go and now and have a, a look around the inspiring leadership compass on some general topics, but mm -hmm. we can go anywhere because yeah. you tend to be able to go anywhere and I love following you wherever it goes. <laughs> Or maybe leading you into into a bad a bad uh, a bad spot. Um, MQ is about your moral questions, your values, and your beliefs. Um, what what would be your your top three values that you've now, after all the learning right. you've done, the distillation? What would you have as your top three? Well, it's in the book: honesty, integrity, and transparency. Honesty. I with hope yourself. you say that. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah. Honesty with yourself, why you do say and think what you do. And then it's transparency is how you step into the world with that honesty. That's your ongoing reputation. And then, of course, the byproduct is integrity. Integrity allows you to be authentic, and it also allows you to dictate your market value because you're the only one of you. And it, it sounds really cool and slick, and it's a nice acronym. They used to call me the hitman. I wasn't going to say no. You know, <laughs> actually, I have shirts, the hitman. And I had, I had a podcast called the, Hits, the, the Hit Show, and the Hit Squad were the listeners. But what it is, it's, it's, it's truth. Because if you tell, ask anybody, what does it mean to be true to yourself, uh, be, to be honest to yourself? Can you be honest to yourself? Why are you actually doing what you're doing right now, saying what you're saying right now, or thinking what you're thinking right now? Is it because you want to leverage something? Is it because you're actually being truthful to you, who you are as an identity and your purpose? Or is it because you're trying to get something out of somebody? When you dig that deep, you're going to have, I mean, I refuse. I mean, I'm unrelentingly a hitman. Unrelentingly. I've turned down 300 grand to, because it was not aligned with, with the company wasn't aligned with, the, with these, my, my core values. I've turned down uh, interviews. I've, I've turned down, you know, meetings uh, with people. It just, I, if, if my intuition tells me, no, I, it's not even a question. It's not even like, well, maybe I could get something and oh, just this one time, because if they don't know it, you do. And, and if, if you know that you compromise in your integrity, it's going to show in your words and your actions. Yeah. And, and, and I was just on a call this morning with another very senior exec and he said he'd done this deal with his CEO. Uh, and then two days later, the, the, the group HR director said, oh, no, he's not doing that. He said, but no, but he said, I know he knows he's changed his mind, but, but it's not happening anymore. He goes, but it's a small amount of money, but it's the principle that yeah. I can't trust him anymore. Yeah. And so he doesn't want to work for, for that organization anymore. Just yeah. that one thing, yeah. because the CEO didn't keep his integrity. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the whole thing about it. People take it so lightly. And this is where we talk about in the book that most people like that, that CEO obviously takes his power and presence from his position. Yeah. And not from his moral basis or from his identity of who he really is. Yeah. I'm the CEO. I can do this. I can do that. And this is a big issue with the corporate world, with the executive, this, with the C-suites these days, is that people forget that they're actually human behind that title. Act Amen. like a human, be a human, lead as a human, empower people, inspire them, find out who they really are as an, as a person and align that personal identity with the purpose of the company and their personal purpose. When you do that, you have a team that is unstoppable. I did it in nine countries, personally, 35 locations, ran 87 locations. And I did it every single time. They always ask me, how do you do that? I would take over a team that was losing money, a million a month. And I would use that same team without firing anybody and we'd be profitable within you know, six or eight months. And like, how do you do that with the same people? I talk to them, find out who they are, find out where they want to go. And I put them in, in, in those positions that align with their personal, with their personal goals and, and their aspirations. And then we fire it up together and we do it as a team, a flat hierarchy. It, I'm not the boss because I have a title. I'm a leader because I'm doing the right thing for them. I don't need to look behind me to see if anyone's following me because I know they are because we're doing the right thing for them as a team, one mission, one vision. And it sounds all you know, nice and slick and everything, but in the book, we go step by step. For every executive team who wants to do this, you start with yourself as a leader, and then you take that and you go to your team, right? And it's incredible, it's, it's, the, it's the empower and momentum and the, you know, then it all leads to quality of life, as you know. I mean, I, I love this stuff so much because none of it is theory. No, and, and, and none and, of it is theory. And that's what I liked it, and <clears throat> why I wanted to have you on this show, because for me, it so resonated. You know, I, I often talk before we even met and I read your book, you know, humility, humanity and humor or heart. But, but you know, and, and that's very much part of what you have. And, and there's a nice turn from that one onto the next element of the Inspiring Leadership Compass, which is uh, what I call PQ, purpose quotient, meaning and purpose. And, and that's been a lot of your work is about creating what is what gives your life? What is your dharma? What is your journey? Why? Why are you, Stephen? on this planet what are you here to do to just just tell me just briefly because i know it but i just want to hear you yeah, tell me well else. you know well it, you know getting to that point is the most important thing you know i think for everyone listening if you think you know your purpose ask yourself really what kind of an impact that has on the outside world is it really your purpose purpose isn't selfish purpose is typically bigger than yourself it's a larger picture it's sort of like we're in the military we sign that blank check and we have this purpose we're, we're ready to die for our country and sudden and then you get out and suddenly you're like what's my purpose to make money to pay the bills I'm going to, you know, and that's why, a lot, you know, a lot of military guys have a really, really issue, really tough time. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm out there doing what I do and people ask me all the time, okay, 
you dated one of the royal duchesses. You worked for politicians. You were in politics. You worked for Andre Bocelli. Uh, who else did I work for? Mick Jagger, Olivia Newton-John, and traveled the world, all these things. Why didn't you ever make a career out of it? That's what they always ask me. I said, that was my career. My career is having an impact on the world around me in this way, in this manner, unleashing your humble alpha, bringing that experience that I had to have in order to write this book with Lane. I had to have that experience. And when I realized that a couple of years ago, I was like, wow, you know, wow. Cause I, 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 you know, I bought into that too. Like, why didn't I make a career out of it? And I was a best-selling author in, in, in Germany in 2003 when I wrote my book about the Gulf war and I was on TV every single day for a year. I was on a book tour paid. I mean, it was crazy and I made nothing of it, but it didn't feel like I had to make something of it. So I didn't do it. I always listened to my intuition, but people started doubting me and they're like, well, you need to do something, man. You're getting older. <laughs> And then I realized a few years ago, no, you know what? This is, this is my something. I needed to take that time. I needed to see all those things that I saw, meet all those people that I met. And the, the truth is this, you know, I walked up to Bill Clinton. I'm like, hey, William Jefferson Clinton, how you doing? Welcome to Berlin. And he talk, turned around, we talked for like, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. Why? Because I wasn't trying to impress him. I was me. I was Stephen, right? I was the powerful connector, hmm. right? And so when you know that, you can walk into any aspect of any situation in life or in business and be yourself and be 100% confident and humble that you can master any, any situation. And that's who I am. That's what I do. And it comes across beautifully. And I, I had a question that came to mind. Is it humble alpha male or humble alpha male and female? Can it, can male it, female. Can it be a male? Can, yes, male yes. Well, we, we actually wrote the book for men. Yes. I, I, sense, was, that. I sense that. But that was more marketing than anything because I knew that if we write it for men, that the women will be like, well, what about us? Yeah, yeah. Oh. that's what my wife said. She yeah. said, so you might go to Peru. What about me? Yeah. Can't I come to Peru? I said, and I'm not sure. Whole, I'm not and it sure. worked. It worked because about 60% of our readers are women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and when you do the trip to Peru, is it just the blokes or is it blokes no. and women? Yeah. Men and women. Men and so women. I, can, I can drag the wife as well. You can indeed. Yeah. You do you ever find indeed. that you get a couple come or is that? Oh, yeah. Lane, that's how I met Lane. Lane, Lane came to my uh, one, one of my because I used to go there by myself before I met Lane. And he came down and that's where we met the first time was his wife. OK, that yeah. sounds a good plan. Because we, we yeah. always love to travel together. Um, oh, do it. Do it. Yeah, we always love to travel. OK. Sure. Um, health quotient is the other thing. Health and well-being. You know, you're you're six foot four. You keep yourself super fit. And you know, what's your top tips about fitness and mental health? Because, of course, clearly mental health is something you have to watch every day and right. physical health, too. Tell, tell us a couple of tips on that. Well, for mental health, um, I, I had I had a mentor in the UK or in uh, Switzerland. He was from the UK. He was His name was Charles Oyster. Um, when I met him, he was like 89. Then he died. He was like 93 or 94. He was uh, a world champion, rower, world champion, but masters. So he started bodybuilding when he was 83. 83 years old. Wow. This guy was incredible. He was sharp as a whip. 90 years old in the gym with me training in Zurich. And this guy would, would kick your butt, right? And 90 years old. And I said, what is it? Like, what did you do? How did you? He said, man, I was out of shape. I was, you know, died, all kinds of stuff. He said two things. Always be in competition with yourself and always set stretch goals. Always, 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 always. And you will never get old. And for me, it's all about the frontal lobe, right? Keeping that creativity flowing, always looking for new things, always seeking out, always finding new, new opportunities, keeping your head up so you can see the doors that are opening in front of you, always being aware of what's around you. And that will keep you sharp and as a whip, and it will keep your brain from deteriorating. You know, it's the frontal lobe where, where um, Alzheimer's comes and all kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very key about that. So I'm always learning, not just audiobooks, not just reading, but learning from people like this. I do three calls or four calls every single day with new people every single day. And I'm always trying to solve problems for them, right? Oh, I'm a master problem solver. So I'm always trying to solve problems, whether it's just us talking, I'm going to give you, the, I'm going to give you advice you know, on how to fix this, that, or the other. So that keeps me active all the time. I'm fired up. It, it's my juice, right? So that's, that's the mental health. And as far as the physical health goes, you know, everyone says, oh, I need discipline to go to the gym. Yeah, the first couple of times, but then you, you got to turn it into a habit. And that habit turns into routines. And then once you get that routine rolling, it's part of your life. You can't imagine, like, I can't imagine. I've been going to the gym since I was 14 years old. Even in the Gulf War, I had water bottles filled with sand that I was working out. You know, it's like, I just can't not work out. And that, that just keeps you young, agile, bone density keeps, you know, it's just so much. I have really bad scoliosis. I have pins in my back. I have titanium, titanium discs and everything else. I still go to the gym. There's no excuse, mm. you know? So it's healthy body, healthy mind, healthy business. Yeah. You know, it's your, your health and your well-being is so important for a healthy business. Incredible.
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't agree more. And and I um, this time last year when my business took a nosedive uh, with with the pandemic, um, I. I found my mental health was very badly affected. I was, I was really, I suppose, clinically depressed. And, and I had some therapy, which was quite helpful. Uh, but A, I couldn't afford to carry on at that kind of rate. It was expensive. But, but B, I wanted to take ownership myself. And, and like, like you, I, I read um, uh, James Clear, The uh, Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. Which yeah. I found really good. And I, and I have it stack. Yes. So, so every morning, 7.30, I'm listening to The Daily Stoic, then I'm on to uh, 20 minutes of uh, mindfulness. I'm doing 365 days of mindfulness. So I'm doing my 20 minutes of mindfulness, just um, a, a sort of zen-like looking out over the, over the back view. Then I do 30 minutes of yoga one day. And the alternate day, I do the HIIT training with weights right. uh, in my garage, which I've converted into a gym. Then I walk the dog for half an hour. And then I start at 10 o'clock. People go, that's late in the day. Yeah, but I might work until seven in the evening. Yep. And I take a, I take a break uh, around about one o'clock and I have a power a power 25 minute sleep and, uh, and we I, have I, almost the exact same routine really oh, uh, okay. exactly but we have a dog we have the kids I, I take the kids to school go to the gym instead of going to the garage we have a garage but it's, it's my, my, my our cars are in there um yeah almost the same thing and then i always take a power nap as well 20 minutes yeah and uh, it's, it's amazing that, that here we are two different guys what yeah. in uh, you in uh budapest outside of budapest i'm actually in a budapest. small a small village of two thousand people it's like a really really small little village yeah well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to come and visit you sometime. Please do. Please have do. Some, uh, can I have a come and have come and see you? EQ yeah. is our next is our next topic. Emotional and social intelligence. You know, powerful connector is your theme. So you have to get into what makes people tick and 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 live in their world. Uh, what tip would you give to other people from the wisdom you've learned about emotional and social intelligence? Yes, meet people where they are. Mm. period don't put don't don't try to come up from above or below or you know i'm better than you or i i need to sell to you so i have to be underneath you meet people where they are that's the most authentic place to meet them and if you're at a higher frequency elevate them right bring them up and if they're at a higher frequency you better step it up simple as that never bring it down never bring anybody down never go down always keep it like that and the way you do it is this and it's in the book as well it's called creating space right? Creating space is showing up wholly and fully for the person in front of you with no preconceived notions, cookie cutter solutions, or anything else uh, besides one intention, no expectations. And the intention is the only thing you control. You can't control the outcome anyway, so forget about it, right? When you let go of the outcome and you focus on the intention, you create a space around the both of you with zero pressure. Everything you know, all the tools you have and, you know, closing techniques, Put it in a toolbox beside you. Mm. If you need mm. it, pull it out, but you probably won't need it because here's what happens. Once you create that space and you're holding and fully for there with focusing on the only intention of adding value by solving problems, you're going to create a space around them that creates that third entity, which we call the mastermind. And you're going to end up with coming up with solutions. You yourself and them will come up with solutions and ideas you never would have had on your own. I am so astonished sometimes. I do hot seats. You know, like live hot seats. People show up. I don't know who they are. This is my business. These are my problems. Uh, how can you help me? And I'll just show up and I'll just listen. Okay. Meet them where they are. Feel what they're about. And be like, okay, how about this? Do this and try that. And, and I'm just astonished with the ideas I get sometimes. You know, it just comes out of nowhere. And that's yeah. because I create that space. I allow. Look, it's like this. It's like this. If someone comes to you and asks you for something that you've never done before, right? They're asking because they see it in you. So obviously you've got it in you, Right. You embrace that, you're all powerful. You know, I had a CEO once from, a, it was UK, it was a PLC listed on the stock, on the London stock market. And um, he said, I want to, you know, I want to make you the director of Europe. And I was like, uh, for operations and development. And I was like, oh, you do realize I'm a bartender, right? Like, basically, I, I had cocktail bars in Berlin, right? And that was pretty much my, my life. And he goes, yeah, but I, I see something in you. I'm like, I've never done anything executive in my life. He goes, just shut up and do it. I see it in you. Mm. And I crushed it. I, I, I mean, I absolutely crushed it. And so I came up with, a, with this analogy that humans are like goldfish. <laughs> you take a goldfish, they're in that little bowl, they're this big. You take them out of that bowl and put them in a river, they'll be this big. This is so true. And, and it links beautifully. James Cameron, uh, listen to his podcast. He's in charge of all leadership development for the whole of Walmart. Great guy. You'd get on well. Was a colonel, got a CBE in the army. Lovely guy. We were at staff college together. Wow. And, and he, his quote was, 
uh, I can achieve whatever my boss believes I can achieve. <laughs> because, because he had one boss who tried to utterly destroy him. He was an academic. He came in. He didn't think he should be there. Uh, he hadn't got a degree and he should have had a degree in his eyes. And so he's trying, he trying to crush him and just get rid of him. And, and anything he did wasn't ever good enough. And then luckily, just before he gave up and thought, I'm, I'm going to have to get yeah. sacked, his boss got sacked. And a new guy came in who goes, James, I really believe in you. Here, do this and this and this. And he said, I just expanded, it. Yep. expanded. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that lovely thing about expectation theory, whether you think you can or you think you can't, exactly. you're probably right. I, well, I, I, I so agree. I was, I was tested to the max for this. So I, I have, I'm a, the, you know, I helped set up a political organization in Germany. 14 years ago. It's now the largest non-party political organization in Germany. And it's turned into a party, which is the third largest party in Germany now out of seven parties. And the head of that party and her husband are my best friends, right? So they invited me to Berlin when I was there. And they said, hey, come over for dinner. I go over for dinner. And um, I'm in like, you know, a pair of shorts and a polo shirt, just, you know, hanging out. And I show up and there's um, people there that you would know from the TV. <laughs> And they all looked at me like, oh, here's Stephen the American. You know, he's an expert on American affairs. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know? And I'm sitting there and here's these uh, people that you would know uh, that I had no business giving any advice to, giving them advice and on the questions. And I, I embraced it. I said, okay, I'm just going to create space. And if they see it in me, then obviously I've got it in me. So just answer the damn questions. And I literally, I got into this flow that, it got to be so bad or so good at what I was saying. They came back to me later and said, how did you know all of that was going to happen? Because it exactly happened how I said it would. And then they accused me of being CIA. <laughs> so I was like, wait a second, maybe that's taking, that's taking, you know, creating space too far. But it just, it just goes to show you that if you allow yourself to embrace what others see in you, you're unstoppable, man. You're unstoppable. I mean, I can't even tell you, I walked into this corporate gig and I went to a meeting. The I was there for a day and they sent me to this corporate meeting uh, with 125 other leaders from this whole company, this listed company. And they asked me to go up on stage and explain a p and I had never seen a PL in my life. Nothing. And I was like, I don't, it's a lot of numbers. You know, I see toilet paper. I see, you know, water costs. And, I, and they're like, you know, the CEO was like, what, what, what are you doing? Like after the, after the thing, like, what are you doing? What happened? I said, what was I supposed to do? I don't know what that was, you know? And then I redeemed myself because I said, you know what? It doesn't matter. He said, look, go up there and crush it. Do a sales talk. So I went up there and did a sales talk. The, uh, the founders, the CEOs, the directors, they all stood on their tables and were like, oh, yeah. My God. <laughs> These are Brits. These are Brits, by the way, doing this. Brits don't do that, do they? Yeah, I know. And they're like, oh, oh my. And guys like, that was freaking incredible. And I said, yeah, well, let me do my thing. And he said, yeah. go do your thing. Go do your thing. And I did. So and I crushed it. In, in doing your thing, it, it, particularly with the humble alpha, one of the things that, um, particularly being Brits, we, we don't get very expressive. Yeah. And when we meet our American cousins who are very expressive, like, Far walking, you know, okay, no, not really into that. That's good. <laughs> so, so we, we do often go and say, but then again, the French go, the perfidian, Al perfidious Albion, they just say one thing and they mean another thing. They don't yeah. say, they say, D darling, do come and have dinner. They don't mean do come and have no, dinner. No. And being a Yorkshireman, I'm very blunt. So when someone yeah. says, do come and have dinner, I turn up. And they go, what are you doing? You're like, well, you said, come and have dinner. Oh, no, it's a, it's a turn of phrase. <laughs> All right, okay. So I only did that once. But, but, but the point is that... Uh, I think that that nice mix between having um, self-belief, but at the same time, that lovely question in the back of your mind, what if I'm utterly wrong? Or when was the last time you were dead wrong? And oh, frequently, you know, yeah. and, and what do you learn from it? And, and, and how did you address it? So how do you balance that, that huge confidence to do something and create space with always just checking in with yourself? What if I'm utterly wrong? How, how do you balance that, Stephen? Well, I, I only take a position or talk about what I know that I'm right on. Like if, if I have any kind of doubt at all, I just won't, I'd be like, well, I don't know the answer to that question. Or let me, let me find the answer for you through somebody else. Like I don't ever guess. Yes. Back, to your, I feel, back to your being a, an advisor who knows what you can advise on. Right. Exactly. So I, if, if somebody asks you a question and said, you know what, that's a great question. Let me get back to you with the answer. I'll go, go to my team. But if I don't, if like, I, I might not know what you're talking about, but if you ask me a question and I feel I have the answer because of the experiences that I have, then I'll give you an answer. And if that's not good enough for you, then I'll say, okay, let me go deeper with somebody else. So I don't, I don't, it isn't, I mean, they were asking me things about, you know, the debt ceiling with Obama hmm. in, in that meeting. 
And I was like, well, I understand debt ceilings. I understand why I want them. Let me just give you my, what I think is going to happen. And I said it and it just happened to happen. Right. But I believe that the only reason I had that knowledge to say it in the way that I said it is because I allowed myself to embrace what they saw in me hmm. without the doubt. Good. Excellent. So with time, because I, I would love to chat to you a number of hours, but with the time we have, let's just do some quick fire questions to the last few. Um, CQ, CQ, which is cultural intelligence, you know, adapting to different people, different culture, diversity, inclusion. What's your sort of top tip on, on being more culturally diverse and coping with different people? Um, this would probably go out to my, uh, my American brothers and sisters more than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Never assume that what you do have say and how you think is the way it is anywhere else. Always go in humbly, always go in quietly and listen first. Listen. It's just sometimes it's cringeworthy, the things that I hear, even on Clubhouse with the different cultures. Sometimes you're just like, you know, because you're, I'm living in Europe so long, almost 30 years now in nine countries, I'm very uh, keyed into the different cultures. Like I love being in England because the humor is so dry. It's almost, <laughs> it's almost a struggle for me to catch it sometimes. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's, it's, it's intellectually challenging. I mean, even your marketing in the UK, Yes. Are you're reading something, you're like, wait a second, they mean something else. I know they mean something else. You know, <laughs> you're trying to catch or, or it. Or our adverts, or our adverts. Yeah. When I was over in yeah. America and watching the adverts, the adverts are so in your face. Whereas yeah. in Britain, they're quite subtle and they, yeah. uh, you know, and never yeah. quite. Okay, great. Love it. The next one was resilience uh, against adversity. Gosh, you've, you've had, and you still have every day as you battle with PTSD, a lot of adversity. What's your sort of top tip on uh, resilience? Uh, you know, deal with, deal with the issues as they, as they arise, as they come, never push them away, never deny them, let them come to you and deal with it front on, head on. And that doesn't mean fight it. That means allow it to go its course or get some help or whatever it is, but deal with it directly. You know, and, and it has a lot to do with optimism. And like I said, every day I wake up, today is my first day, right? The first day of the rest of my life. It's the first day I'm going to have, today I'm going to crush it. Today this is going to happen. Today that, that's going to happen. And I never get to this point in what it doesn't because, because when you try that hard every day and when you have that positive attitude every day, something good's going to happen. Like this conversation is fantastic, the highlight of my day. You know what I mean? And, but it, I wasn't like, I'm going to have a fantastic conversation today because my goals are way out there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Next one. Thank you. I love that one. Brand, brand, reputation, image, impact, reputation, trust. Um, people getting 360 Viva, particularly kind of leaders you and I work with, they, they often have, it's dropped away. They're not getting 360 anymore. They're not hearing it. They're just getting oh, the wow. echo chamber of, of themselves. What's your advice about people to really check in on what their brand and their reputation really is? Uh, in, in the corporate world, I would say there would be honest, honest discussions, you know, I mean, honest discussions with your staff and being able to take criticism, be able, you know, um, you know, I guess you could, you could call it whatever you want, but I would ask people like, look, you, there's no recourse here. Just tell me what you think. And the best feeling in the world for me in business, not in, <laughs> you know, but in business is when someone tells you honestly, you know what, you're an asshole sometimes. You know, you're like, you're, you're like, they, I'll never forget it. This, this girl said like, you're an asshole. Sometimes you just, you, you go things like stop talking and start doing when you say that that's demeaning. Uh, I feel like a slave when you say that she said, I love you. And I follow you. You're amazing. And that, but when you say things like that, it really makes me feel small. And I was like, wow, thank you so much. You know, like that changed me as a leader, just mm -hmm. that one woman who had enough oomph to tell me the truth. And I would ask for that truth yeah. and ask and ask and ask. most people won't do it. Yeah. Right? But the ones who were perturbed the most, they'll do it. And they're the ones you want to hear from anyway. Yeah. You don't want to hear the complainers and the bitchers. You want to have people that actually have constructive criticism. And so if you're a leader out there and you're not, you're, you only have your own, you have to want to know. You yeah. have to want to know. You have to want to get better. You have to want to work on yourself. So to be able to meet them where they are, to be able to create that space with them, to, to create a legacy in that company that no one else is. Right. To this day, I left that company 10 years ago. And to this day, I'm still talked about. That whole structure is set up by me. They've even sold to other companies and they talk about me. They don't even know who I am. I get calls all the time, LinkedIn and everything else. Why? Because of the legacy, the culture that I left behind. You know, culture follows action. Yes. Right? So I left the culture behind and people were like, man, remember when Stephen was here? Remember when Stephen, that's, that's all they ever say. And it gets on a lot of people's nerves, but it wasn't because I was great. It wasn't because I was great. It's because I gave a damn. Yes. And that you talked about the other word, my final word of the Inspiring Leadership Compass is legacy. Yeah. And, and, 
what in a sentence would you like your legacy to be? I want to have an impact on, on, a, on a million people. I want a million people to know the humble alpha and that it changed their lives. A million people, yeah. which isn't that many actually, <laughs> no. but that was it's my, true. you know, it changes all the time, right? It changes no. as you go. Yeah, it, it does indeed. And yeah. so um, last uh, two or three questions. Uh, we're going to talk about executive teams, uh, toxic to uh, uh, high performing, a favorite book that you'd recommend apart from Unleash Your Humble Alpha. Um, and then finally, your two minute top tip, which we'll do just at the very end. But right. uh, <clears throat> what, what would you advise about if you've, if you've got a toxic team with a toxic individual in it or the team's gone toxic? What bit of advice would you give about how to make it go high performing? Well, typically, are you talking about the leaders being toxic or one of the employees? Uh, either. I, um, either. I okay. Well, 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 well typically, someone who's toxic is someone who seeks something, mm -hmm. right? So they're, they're, the person who's acting out is typically seeking recognition or they're seeking something that they're not getting. And I, you know, the six essential human needs, you've probably heard of those before, you know, certainty, uncertainty, all that kind of um, One of those six things will be it. If they're seeking maybe connection, they're, they're maybe because they're acting out, people push them away. And so they're louder to try to get more attention. It's not conscious, mm. right? But they're louder to get more attention because they want to be noticed. They want, they want to feel significant in the team. You know, I had a trainer, Steve Jensen from Australia. We were in the UK training again. And he walked into the room, you know, I'm the soldier, 6'4", and all the British guys are there, and I'm the American, right? The loud guy. He's like, um, what, well, you were in the military, weren't you? I said, yeah, he goes, so stand on the table and tell us what you did. And I did. Stood on the table and told him what he did. And then later, as we went through the training, I know what he did. He saw, as an American, I needed that significant at, at, the, at the moment. So he made me significant, and I was, I was quiet for the rest of the... Of the, of the <laughs> Right, That's brilliant. I must remember that one. That's yeah, it was br brilliant. it was brilliant. He used the disc, you know, the, the, you know, the disc training, you know, dominant, yeah. you know, okay. And so obviously, I was a D type and an I type, you know, so the extrovert, dominant kind kind of guy. And he just nailed it, put me out there and done with it. So if you can find out what those people are lacking, is typically it's it's significance, it's connection, it's you know, some kind of new uh, a new th thing that they're they're missing. One of the six essential human needs. Look 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 them up from Chloe Madonna's. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, you know, toxic teams. I've took, I've taken them over, you know, God knows how many times, you know, most teams are toxic because no one's, most people aren't getting what they want out of the job. You know, job isn't just to make money. You know, most people seek that purpose and almost any career can be uh, purposeful if it's aligned with their own person, personal purpose, but yeah. if they don't know what their purpose is and the company, they got a guy today saying, you know, Hey, I need a strap line for my company. I said, well, what's your, what's your value proposition? What's your mission? What's your, you know, branding language? What do you mean? I'm like, okay. <laughs> Let's begin again. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, final question before we go to the two minute top tip, uh, what would be a, a great book on leadership that you've read recently that you'd recommend those listening around the world uh, read um, or, or listen to? I think blitz scaling by Reed Hoffman. Reed Hoffman is the um, one of the investors and co-founders of LinkedIn, and they 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 go through the different ways to scale a company, and how leadership is you know takes it on. Incredible book, taught me a bunch, especially like the network effect and premium versus freemium, you know these kind of things. So Reed Hoffman, Blitz Scaling, it's an, a will, wonderful, wonderful book. I will definitely listen to that. I've just finished um, No Rules Rules, right? Um, and by another Reed. Reed Hastings. Oh, Reed Hastings. And, oh, almost the same. <laughs> yeah, Reed Hastings. And, and that's all about Netflix. And that's a great, that's a great read. You'd love that one. I've heard about it. Yeah. Yeah. And then we, we were just discussing beforehand uh, this incredible story, endurance about um, uh, what was, was done um, with Shackleton, Sir Ernest Shackleton, and, and how just as they thought they were achieving something, they'd be dashed and their hopes would, then they'd build up again and then something else would go wrong. But they kept the team together. I mean, it's a lovely story about team. Uh, and he kept the whole team. All of them came back, uh, despite the fact they were away for three years and stuck in the ice and almost eaten by killer whales to, Crazy. you know, everything, frostbite and stuff like that. It, just really inspirational. Um, okay, let's go into the, um, just if you do the introduction again, the, f the, the final two minute top tip, and then we'll just uh, wrap up and we'll, uh, we'll go off air and have a chat. Okay. Hello, my name is Stephen Kuhn. I'm a business turnaround consultant, author, and founder of the Have Investment Fund. Here is my top tip for the Inspiring Leadership Show. Focus on impact outside of yourself. This is the path to make a real impact in the world and reach fulfillment in life. This includes the mission of you elevating others around you and helping them step into their own greatness. 
I love that. Stephen, thank you. Uh, we, we have had, a, from my point of view, a fabulous conversation. And I hope those listening enjoy uh, your wisdom and experience as much as I have. I know we'll see much more of each other in the future. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It was an honor.